Right now, I'm sure this music will bring back many, many memories to many people. My guest, the book is live from the London Palladium. Hiya, Neil. Hiya, Billy. How are you? I'm not too bad, mate. Enjoyed the book. Oh, thank you so much. Now, coming from you, that means a lot, actually, because, seriously, when you when you send the book out, I'm, I'm sure you get this a lot, Billy, you send it out to people and they say to you, don't they, oh, I've never heard of that. Has it got, um, has it got Ellie so-and-so in it or has it got Beyonce in it? You think, oh, for goodness sake, we, we did have stars before yesterday. <laughs> well, you have covered a very wide uh, a very wide spectrum, actually, in the book, Neil. I yeah. mean, from, from people like Frank Randall. Yeah. Well, then again, it's an interesting story because Frank Randall was a, 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 you know, it's a lot now because a lot of people won't uh, have heard of him. No. Um, but he was a huge, huge star uh, in Blackpool and uh, massive, really. A, a kind of, if you like, as big as anybody you could imagine today in the world of comedy. And my granddad um, ended up playing for him on the Central Pier in um, Blackpool because Frank uh, had this uh, rather fearsome reputation of firing a lot of people and uh, got fed up with people very quickly. And so my dad, um, you know, was the one who told me that particular story out the book because you, you come away and you think, I tell you what I find funny about it actually, Billy, is when you think about it now in the world that we're living with social media and stuff, he wouldn't last ten minutes, would he? You know? no, no. <laughs> well, tell us about yourself, Neil, because I mean, you, 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 you've got showbiz in your blood. The Palladium to you is like a sacred piece of ground. Yeah, well, you know, for me, I come. You know, my dad was a comedian and compare. My mum was an opera singer and a pop singer, so it was inevitable both me and my brother would go into it. But when we were young kids, and uh, you know, we used to watch the Royal Variety or the Sunday Night at the London Palladium, mm. dad would always sit there, you know, in the chair with a ciggy and <laughs> sit there and say, like, um, now, you know, if you ever make, if you never make it there, you've made it. And it yeah. was one of those things, you know, really, that stuck in your head, wasn't it? You know, you're like, all oh, right, you know. And so I was very young when I got the break to, to a first first appear on the show um, because I was in a, like a musical uh, and we, we ended up doing a royal and I, I don't think he could believe how easy it came it came to me, you know. But on the other side of the coin, it's nature's laxative when you stood in those wings, as we all know. <laughs> OK, now, you, you've interviewed many, many people who've appeared there, uh, in, including p p our own Stan Borman. You've, you've interviewed yeah. Stan Borman, and uh, he got his break through a talent competition, didn't he? He went to the final of a talent competition at the Palladium. Well, that's... You know, then again, you know, it, it, people think things like X Factor and Brit's Got Talent, they're all new. Talent competitions have gone on for years, and Stan, to me, is one of the funniest. I mean, I... Yeah, I've got some lovely pictures of me and him, and I only have to look in, you get a smile just yeah, from it. And, yeah. and his son, Paul, who I used to work with at Sky News, I'm, I don't know how he kept a straight face doing Sky Sports, because he's another one, just a terrible yeah. giggler, great sense of humour. And Stan, as you rightly said, yeah, he got his breakthrough at a talent contest through Butlins also, uh, that used to ho host their own big talent shows there. And, of course, then he went on to be mega successful for people like Johnny Hamp on The Comedians. Yeah. And, you know, you, when you look at these people... I mean, my big break with the book actually came... i tell you what all came around, actually, Billy. I was looking at some old... Um, looking for something, and I came across these cassettes. And uh, for those that don't remember, they used to put them in a tape, plus a keyboard, and they play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, um, and what happened was, when I was a kid, my dad, my mum and dad bought me this little um, dance set cassette recorder. And so I would sit when he was doing summer seasons and stuff, and I'd interview people like, you know, Tommy Cooper, Larry Grace, and Les Dawson, and I just know. literally just talk to them... But what was fascinating, really, Billy, was that, I guess because you're an eight- or nine-year-old boy, the, the openness of what they said 
you know, was fascinating because they obviously thought, well, this is a kid playing around. These will never go anywhere. And so you'd get things like it. I remember Larry Grayson telling me that when he got the um, Generation game, um, Frankie Howard, because he thought he'd got the job, sat in the front row of the audience for six weeks trying to put him off. <laughs> <laughs> you, you had some funny stories as well, as well as interviewing the stars. There's one very funny story which you can tell us about when Prince Charles and Camilla turned up and somebody was in their seat. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. I mean, this this happened quite recently, apparently. It, the Royals, you know what happens there is the Royals, if they decide to go to the theatre, it's probably a bit like you in Liverpool, Billy, when you decide to go to the theatre, you don't need to make a booking. If you're a Royal, you just turn up, and there's, that's why they have the Royal Box. And they tend not to sell that um, you know, in case somebody turns up. But sadly, um, Camilla and uh, Charles decided to turn up at the Palladium, and this particular com- uh, couple uh, it wouldn't move, you know, literally <laughs> said they didn't want to go. <laughs> and so they had to sort of like sweet talk them out, I think is the nicest way. Uh, a little bit of money, a little bit of champagne, and I think, uh, uh, you know, possibly uh, the use of the Royal Box whenever they wanted for the next six months. Can Something imagine, I'd do. You can imagine Prince Charles, <laughs> excuse me, my man, you're in my seat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it must be terrible, though, because can you imagine being, I mean, the manager told me, it's a lovely story, but the manager said he could feel the blood draining from his body. Mm. You know? <laughs> and a few items as well. You let Mark Martin and Lewis, you, you tell me, died a death there. Yeah, well, then again, you know, Dad worked with them very early in his career, and he was saying that, you know, when they came over, um, you know, they it, it was interesting because I was lucky enough to have, you know, met people like Sammy Davis Jr., Dean Martin, when I was very young. And uh, Dean Martin, you know, basically said that, you know, Paramount Studios had, had said, oh, go over, it'd be great to sell films there. Go over to England. And, and they just thought they could get away with quipping yeah. and getting away. Now, Dean Martin, lovely voice, good looking guy, the girls loved him. Jerry Lewis, on the other hand, people just thought, who's this loon? You know, yeah. they were used to great it, comedians. His humour wouldn't have gone over here because it, it was very slapstick, wasn't it? Very slapstick, almost like our very own, I mean, one of my favourites, uh, uh, Norman Wisdom. So I kind of feel that. I mean, they, they actually went better when they went on the Moss Empires tour. They went better up in Glasgow, of all places, yeah. which was normally known as the dicing of death, isn't it? And somebody <laughs> we're, we're very, very fond of in Liverpool. In fact, we helped him a great deal in his career. He's done many London Palladiums. Wonderful guy, Joe Longthorne. You've spoke to him many times. Oh, do you know, Joe, was a, I'd like to consider him to be a personal friend. We did a lovely um, interview, which is now out on plugging on DVD for him. And and he then again, you know, he said to me that, you know, when he started out, because his background was he sang in clubs, he did anything, Joe, you know, and he'd be, yeah. he'd be open about that. Tap danced on bars. Anything. We've all done that, Billy. <laughs> <The> thing, <laughs> <laughs> anything to earn a cross, love. The thing is, he said that when he got there, he couldn't quite, you know, I think, I think that's the running theme of the book, actually. When you get there, and, and, you know, Joe said that, you know, he looked out into this auditorium, his blood ran cold, and he thought, oh, you know, goodness, I've got to do this. Even though he's a super talent, you know, what you find with all of these big talents is that really there's this something in them that clicks in when they walk out onto a stage. But before that, a bit like the Judy Garlands and all of those, to get them to that point takes a lot before you, Mm. you know... And then when they get on, they're fabulous, and they're very relaxed and they love it. Then they need reassurances when they come off because it's you know it's even more daunting. And we did um I did a show at the Palladium uh, last well, this summer you know in the middle of um, two fourteen and it was so funny because I have to be honest and I know you're the king of panto. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but the thing is I don't know if you've ever had this Billy. I was so busy doing everything else you know when it's your own show like I'll be booked this have you got that and so by the time they shoved me on I actually had no I had no energy left and no nerves <laughs> no <you know>? act <laughs> yeah yeah probably. <laughs> (laughs) Okay, stay with me, Neil. We'll be back with you in a moment. A pleasure. Mrs. Butler's eldest. Billy Butler, BBC Radio Merseyside. The book is called Live from the London Play. It's by Neil Sean. It's interviews with the world's most famous stars who've appeared at the world's most famous theatre. You've got lots of glowing things to say, Neil, about <laughs> a man I met many, many times, a gentleman, a man who loved Liverpool, Frankie Vaughan. 
Oh, I love Frankie. I'll tell you what, uh, Frankie Vaughan again, another star that seems to sort of be forgotten by lots of people and yet massively huge, you know, couldn't believe it. And, and in America. Yeah, I mean, mega famous, you know, when you think about it. Then again, it, a family connection because um, Grandad played for him and, and Dad had appeared in summer season in Blackpool with him. But how I met him was, I was, um, how shall we say, between jobs, as we were saying, the business, and I was working in a hotel. The, somebody complained about not getting breakfast and I go down to see them and there I'm faced with the one, the legend that is Frankie Vaughan and he's thinking oh, this young kid won't be able to do anything, you know, and I kept saying, oh Mr Vaughan, of course I know who you are, and I'm thinking this is the man that's kissed Marilyn Monroe in Let's Make Love, yeah. and I'm thinking wow, couldn't quite believe it, and he literally, we became friends after that but he literally sat down and told me everything, you know, all about his career told me about how Hetty King got him to, to do the moonlight thing with the cane and the hat how he said he should always look, you know immaculate, yeah. and that was the thing with Frankie, wasn't it? Every when you think of an image, you see a brilliant image of a man yeah. totally um, at the top, really. Always immaculate. Yeah. Always, they always look to have a great chest as well. <laughs> you know, look at a weightlifted, and they were a lovely couple, him and Stella. Oh yeah, do you know? I mean, she was, you know, love. And then again, you kind of think. I did remember saying to him, "What did your missus think when you were making a film with Marilyn Monroe?" And she leaned forward and said, "No problem for me." I had no problems at all. <laughs> I thought, oh, wow, yeah. there's a woman in control. <laughs> now, you were telling me that the Palladium did try and book Elvis. Yeah. Well, what happened then, again, really, was uh, an interesting factor because Val Parnell, who you'll all remember from Sunday Night at the London Palladium, he had um, he, he had this amazing power to bring over the, these big stars because it's a bit like any show, isn't it, really? Once you get one, they, they go back and say, it's brilliant, you should go. Now, apparently, Elvis Presley was very keen to come over to London, or come over to England, in fact, and what happened was that um, Val Parnell had this money, rang up, of course, uh, Colonel Tom Parker, and he said, yeah, that's great, that's that's fine for me, but what about my boy Elvis? What what would he get? <laughs> and, of course, what we all now know is is that Tom wouldn't let Elvis out the you know, country. the country. Couldn't yeah. let him out the country. But it no, well, he seem... couldn't go out the country, Colonel Parker, because yeah. he's the one who was an illegal alien. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? But you, you, when this is, I think this is what's strange, because I'm sure the Val Parnells of this world, just we didn't have that information at that point, so you must have thought, well, what, what, what on earth can he do? So it does seem a shame. And then, of course, you've got the story that came out a few years ago from Tommy Steele and Bill Kenwright that they did meet or something. That's right. Uh, you never know what, what because that, it's all lost in the midst of time, isn't it? I've, I've never, I'm, I'm, I, whenever you ask Bill Kenwright that, he always avoids the subject. <laughs> He's now, very good at that, though, actually. <laughs> you, you also mentioned about um, bags of nerves, people people when they got on the plating, because it's the ultimate achievement. Like you were saying, Judy Garland was very much affected like that. Yeah, well, I was lucky enough to spend time with both Liza and her other daughter, Lorna loved and they were they both appeared with her and uh, what they said was what was interesting was on a final appearance ever on uh, the London plane was in 1969 and really it was like three months before sadly she passed away top of the bill was Shirley Bassey and uh, they'd kind of hoped that Judy might come on because it was the finale to the series and all this sort of stuff and they brought her from the Ritz where she was staying which is not far just up the road and then when she got to the side of the the wings you know she couldn't do it she just mm. couldn't walk on but there is a lovely Liverpool connection Connection, actually, because your one and only uh, lovely Jimmy Tarbuck told me also that on many nights when he was at the talk of the town with her, he would actually have to walk her on. She just wanted somebody to walk on yeah. with her. Once he got her to the piano, no problem, she could do it. But just the initial walk on. And, but I think the Palladium for Judy Garland was um, a fabulous place because she kind of reinvented herself many different times there. And I don't think she ever really um, sort of put a foot wrong. Unlike Frank Sinatra, who wasn't a success when he first went there. But uh, obviously, you know, as time builds on, he's now yeah. this, the king of king of swing, well, isn't he? Same as when he was at the Empire. I mean, they had to cancel some of the first yeah. houses at the Empire because there yeah. weren't enough tickets sold. Now, one thing did surprise me as well. It was it, when we were talking about Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yeah. I was very surprised to hear you say he's got a great sense of humour. <laughs> Because he said he doesn't look as if he's got a sense of humour. <laughs> he owns the theatre, Billy, work it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that... Um, no, the, the thing, for, then again, for me, with all of these people, and you've met thousands like me, you, you, when you meet them, um, you sometimes you're a bit nervous yourself because they're sort of... You can't quite believe you've met them or you're interviewing mm. them or whatever, you know. And with Lloyd Webber, he's, he's one of these people, he probably is another one that comes alive behind a piano keyboard... Yeah. 
But in real life, you I've know, never can't... noticed that either. <laughs> <laughs> you have a wicked sense of humour, Billy. The thing is, uh, he, 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 when you're interviewing him, it's really hard work, you know. Mm. And then and then they need terrible reassurances. But one, the thing I liked about him when we, I think, the last time we interviewed him was he was saying that, um, you know, if everything went in his big empire that he's got, the last thing he would let go would be the London Palladium. And we I remember we were just sat in the on the stage full enough, and it was closed, and you know all all the lights were off and everything like that. And he said, when you think of where we are now and what's actually gone on, it's an amazing thing to to see. And any theatre has got this wonderful atmosphere when it's closed. Mm-hmm. There's something about when you look around. Um, and I, I thought to myself, well, we are kind of lucky for somebody like him to own it because he has the money to keep it going. And yeah. it's as simple as that, really, you know. When I think of the London Play, you know, as well as all these big stars that appeared there, and uh, over the years I've collected a lot of programmes for the, the for, mm. for the London Play, just to marvel at the people who did appear there. Yeah. The thing that still comes to mind is Beat the Clock. Oh, yeah. The, da, 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 yeah. And Beat the Clock. I mean, I can remember being at the boys' club, and it used to come over the town, like, Beat the Clock, son. We'd all run upstairs to watch <laughs> it on the television. And, and I'll tell you what, whoever whoever devised those games yeah. that when, the, when the bell went should be shot. They were impossible. Well, I think that, you know, obviously Lou Grade was in charge of the money, so you wouldn't win much, would you? Mm. The, 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 the thing about that was that, you know, then again, Beat the Clock, for those that don't know, was a game show interlude in the middle of Sunday. Yeah. At the London Palladium. Here's a well known re- phrase you're saying, rearrange it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it was ridiculous. You couldn't really do it in the time that they said. But I think what we, you have to look back in time because it's a bit like, you know, if they were winning, say, £10, £20, that was more than some week's wages for some people. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of money to, to win. And Bruce was saying, uh, the lovely Bruce Forsyth was t- telling me that they made even a board game out of the game. Oh, I know that, yeah. And it was incredible. I've got like, it. What, have you got I've it? actually got that, beat the clock, yeah. <laughs> And you look now and you think to yourself, how on earth did they get a board game out of that? You know, but but it there's just... a book as well. A book came out. Wow, it's detailing he... all the games. It's just more simpler. I think a warmer, simpler time actually. But I don't know if it would work today because I think you know when you look at people who win things on any of these shows now, unless it's a mansion somewhere in the Bahamas, they all look fed up, don't they? Neil, just before we go, because we'll have to go now. Come up to the news. One glaring omission. Oh yes. Glaring emission. Because <laughs> he broke the record there. Yes. Ken Dodd. Now, yes, Ken Dodd, I tell you what, we've met Ken many times and uh, he's a lovely guy. Get he, in fact, I have to say, he's probably, after Norman Wisdom, my favourite comedian. He never fails to make me laugh. The reason why we couldn't include him in is because we had so many and I didn't get to pick But the he final... broke the record, didn't he? I know. He, he broke the record. He, he ran for the... months there. Months. And he's absolutely a gem. And yeah. when you sort of sit with him, you know, it's hard to, even at his age now, it's hard to sort of stop get him Get a word in. Funny. Yeah, he's <laughs> yeah, just brilliant. Right, yeah. But he's brilliant. And, yeah. and I look at him and I think to myself, but the, the problem I had was like somebody said to me the other week, Oh, you didn't, you haven't written as much as I thought you may on Tommy Steele, but you know, there's oh, so many a, yeah. to get in that you, you know, you, yeah, you've you got, got Danny you Kay, and... you've got Johnny Hamp, you've got Vince Hill, yeah. you've got Russ Conway, uh, you've got, as you say, Frank Randall, <coughs> many, many more. They're lovely people, and maybe there's a book too there, Billy. Who knows? Oh, definitely, <laughs> I would think so. Neil, lovely talking to a you. Pleasure. Take the, care. The book is called simply Live from the London Palladium. Neil Sean. It's a great read from Amberley for just nine ninety nine. Thanks, Neil. Take care. Love. Bye. And here's another guy that Neil writes about in the book.